Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to our virtual panel conversation with the Curator and Long Island Biennial Artists. We are so glad um, to have you all join us this evening. I am Carolyn Blee, Assistant Curator at the Heckscher, and I will be your host for this evening. And following their 30 minute conversation, our speakers will be responding to some of your questions. So please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box on your screen at any time. Without further ado, I'll ask our panelists to join us. Okay, so joining me on screen are Hutcher Museum curator, Carly Wurzelbacher, and exhibiting artists, Deborah Buck, Paul Farnucci, Holly Hunt, and Danielle Lavodi. Yeah, I hand it off to you. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> um, before we get started, I would like to thank the Long Island Biennial Exhibition sponsors, Peen and Hans Bosch. Um, thank you for your support of this exhibition and programming. Um, and I would also like to thank Carrie, uh, Carrie Lynn, our assistant curator who just vanished from the screen, um, but we owe her a huge thanks for all of the work she did on the biennial. So thank you very much, Carrie. Um, so I am going to dive in with some questions for you all. It's good to see everybody. Good evening. Let me just uh, share some images so we have something to look at here. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> so I'd like to start tonight. Um, I think it's only fitting because this is the Long Island Biennial after all. Um, I would love to ask each of you what brought you to Long Island or what keeps you here? And I wonder if you could also talk about um, the way in which Long Island impacts your work or appears in your work, maybe in very overt ways, maybe in subtle ways. Um, so I'm curious to hear if you could each answer that question. That would be great. And I, I see Deborah first, so maybe I'll ask if she could start us off. Um, okay, hi, hello everyone, um, and um, just would love to say uh, what a great privilege this has been to be included with all these really incredible artists and in this um, really fantastic institution. Um, it's, it's like a, a jewel for Long Island to have the Heckscher Museum and also to have the biennial, you know, I think that to represent all of us, so thank you. Um, so let's see what brought me to Long Island. Um, I, um, I came out to Long Island eight years ago um, and I was sort of in a life change and uh, my son had gone to college and I was no longer married and I'd had a house up in the country in Garrison and I knew that I liked having a place to kind of get my, uh, to, to change my head outside of New York and so I thought, okay, I've always loved the ocean. And um, so I came out and, and I bought a house in Sagaponic uh, near the ocean. Um, I loved this sense of community of artists um, on the East End. And certainly all my life had been very aware of the history of that community. Um, you know, hearing early on about Hans Hoffman and um, Jackson Pollock and um, and then, you know, up to Julian Snobel and then to David Sally and Eric Fischel, and, you know, which brings us up to date. So anyway, I wanted to be kind of a part of that and, um, um, and really to be by the water. And, and I had always heard about the light on Long Island. So, and, and um, it's all been kind of wonderful. I found it a very inspiring place to work. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Holly, I see you next, so. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you, first of all, thank you so much. So I was born and raised in Long Island, actually born in Huntington Hospital. Wow. So yes, <laughs> so <laughs> Long Island is my home in a sense that I've lived here the majority of my life. Uh, I feel the art community here in Long Island and the inspiration here is so plentiful. Uh, of course, as mentioned, the beaches, the sunsets, the fact that New York has changed of seasons. Because I'm ex an explorer by hobby, I'm constantly driving around. And in my travels, I've been really lucky to find some really precious and small 
hidden gems that exist in the corners of Long Island that lots of people don't know about. I go there and I meditate and I ground myself in these places and this actually really positively impacts my focus on my art and my art also. I also exhibit quite a bit with my work so Long Island offers a ton of opportunity there for me too. Okay. Okay, great. Um, Paul, what about you? Um, I was living in Long Island City. I had a loft there and my building was being sold right before the gentrification of the area. And I wasn't sure where to go. And I was te I got a job teaching on Long Island and I took the Valley Stream with younger kids and then I got a job at Hofstra. So it just seemed like I should be going to Long Island. I remembered as a child going to the Roslyn Duck Pond and I had really fond memories of sort of the quaintness of the town. So I sort of went around looking there, and then my brother, who was living in Huntington, right, said, you should check out Seacliff because of all the old homes and the color and the textures of the town, and that it was a lot of artists living there. So I sort of wandered there and looked at a house. I never owned anything before, and just it sort of happened really quickly. And the ha living here has been really, really good for my work because I love all the sort of old, um, history in the houses. I'm using them to make my sculptures. I, um, I'm by the water too, so I like the light from by being by the water. And the community is very small. You can walk around. It's really um, safe. And sort of my niece, when she came the first time, said it's like a magical little town, um, which I love that idea of it. Um, so, and it's it helps with my teaching. Now, the commute is much easier. So I'm just it's it's been great. I. I miss a little bit about being in the city, but I'm learning, finding other things, and I'm so close to the city, so I feel like it's the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. That's great. And what about you, Danielle? Oh, thank you. Um, so for me, uh, I was also born and raised on Long Island, and all my family and friends are here, and I have been teaching here at New High Park Memorial High School for the last 13 years. Um, so for me, like, I only really ever lived away from home for about a year. I was up in Boston when I went away to college, and uh, I actually started as a journalism major, and I loved writing, but um, quickly discovered that you know, I wanted to really follow my passion, which was teaching and art. So putting them together. Um, and I knew if I was going to teach, I, I wanted to come back and, and be here on Long Island um, just because I had so many excellent teachers and experiences here. Um, so it's been really great to be able to kind of, you know, give that back, I guess. Um, and I'd say like for me, I kind of, you know, kind of dabbled between, I was living in a condo, it was smaller. I didn't really have a lot of personal space to make work. And this summer I recently moved into a house as well. And it's near, kind of near the water also. It's kind of interesting to hear everybody mention something about that. Um, and so now I have a little bit more space and like an actual room to create work in. So I think, you know, living here, having access to this room and this house um, is definitely been able to allow me to make more work. Um, and then since so much of my work is inspired by experiences, memories, life events, um, I always find myself looking at and observing, you know, different people, my surroundings. And for me, daily journaling is really important. And there's so many beautiful places here on Long Island, like everyone's mentioned, the beach, the water, parks, um, access to things around in nature. So sometimes I'll take my journal outside and, you know, do a little bit of that um, in some of these places nearby and just see what else I can absorb from the surroundings here on Long Island. Okay, great. Well, let's, um, let's jump off from there. Um, I would love to ask each of you some more in depth questions about your work and also to kind of bring your work into dialogue. Um, so I thought I would start by asking um, a, a, some questions to Deborah and Danielle. And I was neglecting my slide duties here. I left this slide up for too long. <laughs> um, but we can start here. And I, you know, in looking at both of your work, um, it's very different, of course, but I think you're both um, involved with layering and the process of layering. Um, and it's interesting, you both kind of have this linear quality or these, these lines that are existing amidst and on top of um, a kind of a colorful field of marks. Um, so I wanted to ask you about layering and then also about these 
these kind of interior personal worlds that you each seem to be um, expressing or, or fabricating or creating. Um, so to talk about layering first, um, could you say more um, about layering, what, what that process allows you to achieve formally, and also if, um, if layering takes on any other meanings or resonances for you um, psychologically or emotionally or in other ways? And I, I wonder, Deborah, if you would be willing to start off and then if Danielle could chime in. Um, sure. Let's see. Um, yes, I've always been very interested in um, digging through the layers, creating layers and then digging back into them. Um, and um, I, the Italians have an expression, um, pentimenti, which means the layering. Um, and um, so for me, it's, I, I like to um, exhibit the history of the baking of each piece. Um, I think of, uh, you know, I don't begin with a um, prescribed notion of what I'm going to find. Um, and I think of my work as each painting is a journey and it's a treasure hunt. And the resolution, the formal resolution of the painting um, in the composition and the line, foreground, background, um, are the treasure that I'm after. Um, I started a few years ago using Japanese ink, um, and that's the black line that you see. That I use drawing on, on top um, of the, the rest of the, the work. And I found that that created a foreground and a background. Um, and it also um, let you sort of see deeper into the painting and see more of the process. Um, uh, one of my favorite quotes from Picasso is that each painting is the sum of its destructions. And I think, at least for me, that that is very, very true. Um, when, when, I'm, when I hit a wall with a painting, when I'm frustrated, the thing I know I have to do is to sort of destroy the part of the painting that I'm most attached to, uh, because it's too slick, it's too, it's almost too good, you know, too, it, it, it's too whatever. So anyway, and I have to really get it real again and, and destroy it. And inevitably, when I get the guts to do that, then the whole painting comes together um, because that energy uh, kind of encapsulates its, itself. Mm -hmm. Danielle, what about you and layering? Do you uh, similar experience or a kind of a different, um, yeah. Okay. So to kind of piggyback off of Deborah, first of all, I love uh, the way you described your process in there, like the treasure hunt, the destroying certain parts that you need to destroy. And it's so scary sometimes to do that and be yeah. vulnerable. Um, yeah. but I kind of know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so for me, um, like formally with, with layering, obviously, I am working with collage pieces. That's usually how my pieces begin. Um, I start with some uh, physical artifacts from my journal pages or things that I've collected that are really personal to me. Um, and it sort of just kind of becomes this, you know, giant puzzle that you're you're formally putting together balance and composition and lights and darks and shapes and textures on your surface. Um, but in that process, you know, I'm always in the back of my head thinking about, um, you know, what am I personally going through that I want to engage with in here? What are the words or phrases that are here that need to come to the surface? Um, so the layering starts to take on a much more emotional and psychological impact for me. Um, like I said, the, the things that I'm collaging on initially are really uh, personal. There are things I've saved for years and collected and you have an attachment to them. Uh, they might be pieces of my personal history, past relationships, high school love notes, mementos from family members who have passed away that I've kept. And uh, as they make their way onto the surface, uh, it's a way of me being able to kind of let go a little bit. Um, so it's definitely, you know, this kind of cathartic experience in, in layering over them. And then uh, I start to heat up the surface and use that as a way to reactivate some of the adhesives and stuff that I'm using. So I start to peel away and uh, 
you, you're allowing people to now see what's underneath. Um, and it's just really like, you know, digging emotionally to, to pick and choose what I want the viewer to see, what I'm comfortable sharing, um, and still formally create these spaces compositionally that allow people to kind of breathe and rest and hopefully find a little bit of themselves and their experience in the work as well. Okay. Um, I wanted to come back to Deborah um, to ask about your, um, what I think of as your really fantastical kind of unique set of, of imagery. And it's really an entire world unto itself. Um, it's very magical and whimsical. And um, I wonder if, you know, is this entirely coming from your imagination or do you have some real world touchstones or experiences that find their way in, um, you know, where does this come from? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. Um, so, you know, certainly there are lots of touchstones. Um, these, but these are all mindscapes. These are worlds that I create. And, you know, I, I sort of always say that, um, that when I create these worlds and I create these characters, they make life that much more interesting for me. I would love to be able to walk out the door and have these characters and to be able to talk to these characters and ask them what they're thinking and you know what their stories are. Um, I, you know, as a kid, I grew up on a farm um, and um, I spent a lot of time alone and I read a, a great deal. And I read a lot of fairy tales and I read Alice in Wonderland over and over again. Um, and so, you know, the, like, and Alice in Wonderland is still a, a big touchdown. I read it like once a year. I read bits and pieces of it. I quote it constantly because it's about metamorphosis, really. Alice changes all the time and everyone is always coming and going and disappearing and coming back, but it's only their smile or et cetera, et cetera. So I think that those are all um, very succinct metaphors for my experience of my life so far. Um, and um, so I, I have never been interested in uh, portraying nature because I feel like I can't make nature any better than it is. Um, but I can harness my own imagination to make the real world more interesting. Um, so, you know, so I think, um, yeah, I think I think that that's probably put it. And but and I did work as an illustrator. I worked for Disney for a while. Um, but I and I'm very careful. Although I can be facile as an illustrator, I'm very careful not to let that creep into my work as a painter. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of tricks that I know how to do, but I'm very careful. Yeah, you know, to not use those and 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 to unless it's in a very very painterly way. Um, so um yeah but it, it's um yeah they're 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 my characters all right i mean i'm ha and i love sharing them i love it when people get them and like them and want to know more about them um but i would keep making them even if they didn't yeah thank you that's it's fascinating to know a, a little bit more about um some of the influences although you said as you say um, nothing kind of, it's not a one-to-one -one and nothing really accounts for the way that these look, but it's interesting and, to hear. And so, you know, you'll see in many of my, in many of my pieces, uh, somebody's always wearing a crown. Um, so, you know, again, that's from fairy tales. So that represents power or, you know, in a, 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 a relationship of one of these creatures to the other. I love rabbits, but, you know, there was a big white rabbit, a Harvey the white rabbit. I mean, so I love rabbits because they're kind of uh, nimble, nimble, but, but not ferocious. And, you know, sometimes the paintings get a little more dark, um, but then there was Grimm's fairy tales and they certainly were dark, but they were fairy tales. So I, I, I refer to them lots of times as fractured fairy tales. Um, and, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where they come from, but there are references like the other painting, which is called Space Hedges. You know, I, I, I find the hedges in the Hamptons completely fascinating, um, because they're so organic and kind of independent of the houses that they shield. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and they feel very, very animated to me. They are very organic and animated, you know, as if they could kind of get up and walk away on their own. Um, and and it, it goes on and on, but you know, those kinds of things, you know, that I kind of become sort of, you know, I kind of wish they'd go the next step, um, you know, to, to kind of come into my world. I remember my brother told me when I was young that at midnight on Christmas Eve, all the animals could talk. And I thought, oh, finally, wow, if I could just stay up till midnight. So yeah, you know, I think everything's animated. I think a vase, I refer to vases as her, you know, I, things are, are, you know, are very animated to me, even inanimate things. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, Danielle, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the specific work you're showing. Um, and similarly, could you unpack for us, um, you know, to the extent that you're willing, um, mm -hmm. some of what we're looking at, and I can show either painting, um, if you could share more about um, maybe some of the specific words or um, the specific source material that you used to, yeah. to as a starting point. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so the piece that's on the screen here titled Home, um, both, both pieces that are in the biennial were pieces that I made uh, right at the beginning stages of quarantining and lockdown and this whole global pandemic thing that really threw everybody for a loop here. Um, so uh, in creating this piece home that's on the screen, I really began with uh, layering journal pages that were initially just really personal journal pages about a relationship that I was in and this, this mental space that I was in. Um, and then from there, I just started to get more and more impacted by the pandemic, isolation, being kind of confined into in this space that I was living in that was causing me just a ton of stress and anxiety. And the fact that I really couldn't leave there and just go be with my friends and family. Um, it was really difficult. And I just honestly wanted to move and in creating the artwork, um, kind of rewriting and releasing these words and phrases and almost at the same time, I guess, manifesting what I wanted for myself through the painting is really, I feel like what happened. Um, and I kind of pushed myself uh, in creating this to just be like, why am I not just trying to move then? I need to just move. <laughs> so um, creating it really did kind of release a lot for me. Um, and I was able to kind of move through that, release that emotional energy into the work. So um, making these little repetitive paintbrush strokes with these little rectangular kind of shapes. I don't, in, in my head when I was doing it, I kept feeling like they were just little, little homes, little cities, little places, little marks. Um, and I would, you know, scribble across the canvas uh, and then cross stuff out that, that I was, you know, feeling like I needed to disappear and, and release. Um, and the other work, which was titled Alone Together, um, this process was created pretty much the same way. It was initially uh, completely covered with journal pages relating to a past relationship. And then uh, that made me really sad to think about the fact that I'm in the middle of this pandemic. I'm living alone. I'm by myself. And um, again, I had all this emotional energy to channel. Uh, you're feeling very isolated. And for me, I started to find comfort in making this piece because I would tell myself while I was working on it, like everybody in the world right now is feeling this way to some extent, feeling isolated, feeling maybe depressed and anxious and so many things rolled into one. Um, so for me, it was like just cathartic release and, and, and a way to heal, a way to try to process everything that was going on with COVID. And, uh, at the same time, uh, try to kind of mend a little bit of, you know, like a, a br that broken heart feeling, which was another thing that in my work, uh, the shared relationships, that interconnectivity, finding that comfort in the fact that every human being to, at some point or another will experience these similar things. And, and that makes me feel a little more connected, which is good in a time when you're not really able to be so connected to people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, this discussion about home is a great uh, way to bring Holly and Paul into the conversation. I just want to show though first, Danielle, this um, image of your work in progress. Yes, thank you. I tried to blow it up a little bit so people could get a sense of the pages. Um, yeah, this is the piece that I'm currently working on. It's like a 48 by 48 inch canvas. And uh, there's a, a lot of heavy layering happening in this piece now. So this is kind of, I'm not, I'm not sure what, what stage we'll call this in. I, it, like, uh, you know, it's part of the whole process of uncovering, covering, and just seeing what each day brings with it. But this is kind of roughly what's underneath a finished piece. So we'll see how much of the, the journal pages and, and writing comes to the surface at the end. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, so um, Paul and Holly, I wanted to put this question about home to you because it's interesting that each of you in your work were already working uh, very heavily and primarily with the idea of the home or domestic space. Um, and, and now it's something that we're all thinking about. Um, and at the same time, you each, um, you each kind of trouble that idea of home, almost in a way that Danielle was talking about, like feeling home as confinement or, you know, not having always a positive associations with home or, um, you know, just grappling with the complexity of, of the domestic space. So I'd like to ask each of you if you could tell us more about what brought you to this imagery. Um, what ideas or um, uh, other explorations does that idea of the home or the structure let you unpack or explore? And how has that changed for you, if at all, since the quarantine? Um, and maybe Holly, if you would start us off and then Paul, if you could jump in. So I, I explore and photograph abandoned locations. When I'm inside abandonment, memories trigger, and that's where I'm able to capture my photos. From seeing something, I, I just, something hits me and that's it, and I bring it to life in front of my camera. Uh, I've always searched for a home. I wouldn't say that I've had a fascination with home or that home is a scary place to me. It's always been this lifelong search of always trying to figure out what it is and questioning, maybe it's not just one specific place. Maybe it's just many places that give us comfort and peace. And that's actually kind of how my photography collection started, which is Abandoned Beauties. Because as I said, I go into these places and they make me feel happy and peaceful, which seems kind of crazy to most people, <laughs> but that is is where I find my life and I'm able to bring back um, those memories and trigger those things. I do have a really bad memory, so it actually helps that too. Um, the image that is in the biennial, which is titled The Weight, actually tells the story of my goodbye to my childhood home, as well as to my mom in a single year of my life. If you look at the photo, it looks like a really simple house, but it's, it's not. The entire back of the house is gone, and you can see that it's just a facade. Mm -hmm. So to me, it kind of, I, these questions came up. Um, was the place that I grew up in, that I grew up in, only home because my mom was there? Um, or was it just like a waiting room until I found a home of my own? Mm -hmm. So hence the wait. <laughs> so that's where that came from. Um, but yeah, that's that's really it. I, I find home in everywhere. <laughs> so everywhere I feel comfortable and peaceful. And that happens to be in places that are falling apart. I love that idea of home uh, being not one place, but being this. Um, a state of mind almost, um, or a state of feeling maybe. Um, Paul, what about you? What brought you to um, the idea of the home or home imagery? Um, um, I was um, sort of really thinking about how with technology and sort of our age now being on cell phones and I was 
really thinking about how we hear private conversations when we're walking through the streets and sort of how our private worlds and our public worlds were sort of getting sort of mixed together. And I was trying to think of a way, you know, sort of dealing with that. And so I started wanting some way to contain that information. So I started thinking of the idea of the home, which was always sort of, in my mind, sort of this safe haven where you would go. And, um, and I sort of started thinking about that and playing with the idea of drawing a house and playing with the image of the house and then sort of thinking about um, sort of the inside the home, something else would be taking place, some sort of something to do with society, some dirty little secret that was happening. So the home became a metaphor for society for me. So I sort of wanted inside the home to be sort of, you had a, you find some kind of image about something that was either going on in current events or something I was thinking about would be taking place inside. And maybe there would, it would be some kind of um, injustice or some kind of dealing with something I was dealing with in my own head about what was going on in the world. Mm -hmm. I sort of started doing the houses because I was, um, working really large. I wasn't working sort of sculptural at that time. And I was trying, I was wanted to do something quick and small. And I was applying for an exhibit that wanted only works on paper. So I did my first house, which was actually not really a house. It was a tiny confessional for, with a, a priest inside. And I liked the whole, it was really important to me, this whole, whole idea of peeking into the house, the sort of voyeur aspect of it. Cause I was thinking the whole idea about our private and public lives, how they mix together, and how now we're peeking into, into people's worlds when we're listening to their conversations, not on purpose, but <laughs> um, so sort of it grew from there, and I sort of started playing with that. I, I did, after I did the confessional, I moved on to a schoolhouse because I was teaching, and I was really very frustrated with the type of things kids were being asked to do, and being a creative person in the educational public school was really difficult for me. It's still difficult for me because I feel like there's not a lot of room for creativity. And so I started doing the, the first sort of house or schoolhouse was a, um, dealt with sort of kids and testing. And it was called ABC SAT. And it was to a teacher and a baby in a high chair. And they were, she was teaching, preparing this baby for the upcoming SATs. And, um, and, and ironically, this was done years ago, they were both wearing masks over their faces. And I, I, I said, I'm the first one to put masks over kids in school. Because <laughs> I was thinking, I always had the feel, and the image always was really strong to me, of like a gas mask or a mask on, but sometimes it's very suffocating being in an educational system. So that's where that came from. Okay. And um, now the piece I have in this exhibit was sort of, but the first piece I did during quarantine, and I was just thinking about the, you know, the very basic disposable face mask and how it just sort of, I just decided instead of having you actually see anything in the house, I wanted to just sort of um, protect the whole house, at least in that image. Okay. Um, Paul, in a way you answered, you answered a question that I wanted to ask you, which was to what degree um, uh, any of your imagery was kind of rooted in the personal because I know often you are um, grappling with these larger societal issues. And I was curious to know um, what parts of it kind of connected to your personal experience. Um, we have another image of yours to show. And I wonder if you want to talk a bit about um, the Silence of the Lambs piece um, and kind of what's going on here. Okay. I, I, I go back and forth. I mean, I deal, like, like you said, I do deal with sometimes a, a you know, current event issue or something that's sort of I'm struggling with or I write about or, but then I go back to personal things. And this again leads back, links back to my teaching and my struggle with um, working there. And so I kept getting this image of teachers sometimes feel like they can't, they can't make any decisions on their own. They're afraid to. And so they, I kept getting this image of sheep walking to almost to off a cliff or something and the schoolhouse with the uh, tornado was going on and I was I, I, this is one of my first images the um, Wizard of Oz and fairy tales it's funny that Deborah said that Roy's coming into my head and 
I didn't plan the Wizard of Oz, but she see, keeps coming out in my work, the, the, the move, parts from the movie. The schoolhouse that I talked about before, the sculpture, has two doll legs poking out from under it, like the, so the schoolhouse fell on the doll, it looks like. And this one, I was the, the, after I created, I kept saying, oh, it's the hurricane from the Wizard of Oz, and the schoolhouse, the, some kids are falling out of it. So I, I go back and forth, that's more again my schooling, and then I've done works where they deal with sort of um, broader issues or, or more personal things like the loss of my mother and stuff like that. But they still sort of, they usually connect somehow. Mm -hmm. um, Holly, we have some other images from you also that I wanted to share. Um, so we have this image of you exploring and photographing, uh, which you've talked about. Um, I, we also have, the self-portrait and then we have this image um, and I wonder if you could tell us more about what we're looking at in these two instances. So the self-portrait is new. Uh, talking about the pandemic and how our work has changed. Mm -hmm. Mine has drastically changed this year because obviously prior to the pandemic I was traveling all over and I was doing you know, uh, my, my exploring and my photography all over the place, the pandemic put a huge halt on that. And I had to refocus my, my direction on what I wanted to do with my art in order to continue on my artistic path. Mm -hmm. And the only way that I felt that I could do that was to do two things. Uh, one was to write a book and one was to change the way that I photographed. Because of social distancing, I had to start to utilize myself in my work instead of bringing someone with me, which is in the weight, which is in the biennial. That is not me, that's a model. So my self-portrait game became very strong. <laughs> and uh, now I actually prefer placing myself in front of the camera because it adds more of a personal element to me. This is a self-portrait of me in uh, an abandoned location. It's actually symbolizes my story of bullying when I was a child and wanting to just be hidden from society. A lot of what I was bullied for was because of my face, my acne, my hair, really anything on the exterior that could be seen. Uh, and I just wanted to always hide that. So that is the self-portrait. And then the other photo of the tree kind of <laughs> taking over the house. I saw this house and it just really spoke to me. One of the things that it triggered in my memory and why I felt I needed to photograph it was there was this huge tree in my backyard that held a tire swing. And when I was a child, I considered that to my favorite thing. I wasn't very athletic. I didn't do anything outside except maybe play in the grass, make some headband wreaths out of flowers. I love the tire swing, I love the pool. <laughs> so that was pretty much it. But a hurricane came, the tree went down. It did not hit my home, like the photo, but when the tree came down, I felt part of my home was gone. As I had mentioned before, my home isn't four walls and a ceiling. It's many places where I feel comfort and peace. And that tire swing was that part of my home when I was a child. So when I saw this house, that was what triggered in me. And it's been sitting, the history of it is I don't know much, except it's been sitting like that for a very long time. But to me, it brought me back to mm -hmm. that memory. Thank you. Um, we, I, I could talk to you all, uh, all night. <laughs> but we have um, audience members, some of whom may have questions. I'm not sure if anyone who is listening and has been typing in the Q&A box. Um, but I would welcome Carrie to come back on screen and share if we have any questions. And if not, I, you know, I have some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, just one question really, um, but it's a really interesting one and I am really curious as well. I just wanna thank you all for the incredibly interesting conversation. This has been really great. Um, so the question is, and it's for each of you, so you can uh, take your time and think about it for a second and then <laughs> try to answer. Um, how do you select which artworks to submit to the bank? Daniel. So take a minute. <laughs> Does anybody want to start first? I can start because okay. for, for me, it was, um, it was 
kind of easy, I guess, because I had really not been able to make a lot of personal work prior to this year, maybe last year. Um, and I just think because of being quarantined, I was in a situation where I was able to actually be home, make work, you know, being a teacher, there's a lot of demands um, to be working on samples for your students to generate your lesson plans and everything. So time management in that sense was always, you know, focused on work instead of my personal art experience. So uh, for me, it was kind of like a no brainer to uh, just kind of go out on a limb and do the application for the biennial and incorporate um, the three larger pieces that I had worked on uh, from, I guess it was from March through May-ish that I was working on these. So that's how I selected mine. Great, thank you. Who's next? <laughs> how about Holly? I can go next. Actually, I was in the biennial two years ago, and I had a different piece, obviously, in that exhibit. It's kind of interesting how I picked that piece because I ended up picking this piece in the same way. Uh, my mother had passed six months or maybe even four months prior to the call for pieces for the biennial two years ago. I was torn among four or five photos of mine. I didn't know which one to submit. So I put a survey out into social media amongst my friends and family, and they all came back about, I would say 20 or 30 responses. Each one got five or six. So that did not help me whatsoever. <laughs> so my, I ended up getting on a conversation with my very best friend and I asked her, what should I do? And she said, I think that you should pick the one that your mom would pick. And that's the one I chose. That is the one that was accepted. And I decided this year that I would do the same thing, that I would choose the one that I felt that she would love. That's a really interesting way to do it. I do like the the polling friends and family too. That's, <laughs> you know, giving it to your own jury before you put it out to ours. <laughs> How about Paul? Um, well, that was the first piece I sort of created during the quarantine. And I was working on a bunch of other things, but they were really large and I felt like they weren't resolved yet. And I just sort of, sort of thought it was timely. And I figured it was the time to do it right now with it. And that's how I ended up with that piece. Great. Yeah, that, that was nice. I'll just jump in to say that we um, didn't want to do a show about the quarantine, um, but it was nice to see the way that um, inevitably in contemporary work made in the last two years, like of course it was going to come up here and there. So, um, as a viewer, I kind of appreciated that. In, in, some, in some people's work, it's front and center, and other people's, it's, um, you know, you don't kind of see the connection until you've been sitting with the work for a while. But um, I, so that's just something I found really interesting. Yeah. How about you, Deborah? Um, let's see. Um, the, this painting, The Waiting Room, um, and it's interesting that Holly had the painting called The Wait. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I have loved like all the different pieces of synchronicity that have happened in these, this conversation um, amongst all of us anyway. Um, and um, so this was obviously during COVID and, um, you know, it's my thinking about the disparate characters in a doctor's waiting room and that, you know, all walks and that, you know, people were kind of being um, all brought to the same place, the same level because in the waiting room, everybody's got the same nerves, the same fears, the same anxiety, regardless of who they are, whether they're the rabbit or they're the king or the queen or, you know, whoever, or the, the baby. Um, and so, yeah, the sense of, you know, waiting, what will, what is going to happen? What is our fate? What is, uh, and um, yeah, so the, I think this piece, um, uh, operates on its own in, in, you know, without that notion, my notion of COVID. Um, but, you know, when I look at it and I think about when it was made, I know that that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have a few more questions that came in while we were answering. Um, this is another question for all the artists. 
Have you ever returned to a work that you created when you were younger and revised it based on your experiences since? Anybody want to start? I can make that easy. I have not. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have not. I did have my first camera, which was a Polaroid handed to me. And I just got a kick out of shaking that up and seeing the photo come up. <laughs> so, so that is the only thing as a child that I could say has affected my work, but no, I've never returned to anything. No. Um, I'll speak next for, for me. Uh, that's actually like a big part of my process is I, I like working on top of things I've already created. It's kind of part of a little bit of what we talked about earlier, that whole like creating, destructing, uh, everything to me is kind of like fair game and something that I can turn into something new. It kind of forces me to work on top of something else. It, it forces me to try something different on there. Um, and then it's kind of like a, a little, you know, it's, it's a little weird and exciting at the same time to be like, okay, this thing existed. I put all this time and energy into, into this thing when I made it, however long ago it was. And, uh, now I'm in a new place. I, I like my work to try to reflect the time and place in which I'm living and experiencing things. So um, I, I do often just work right on top of old pieces. Great. I never do. <laughs> never have. Never do. But, but all that to say is that because each, um, each, each painting is um, such a head-on involvement, um, and until it's finished, I, I'm never rested. I, I'm, I'm agitated by resolving, you know, the, whatever problem I've set for myself. Um, and I think also because I go through that process in the making of each painting that, you know, again, that's some of the destructions. Um, so I can never go way back to that place because it's always the, uh, you know, a, a, a really immediate, intense relationship with each painting and they either get destroyed in the process and thrown away which doesn't really happen very often um or they've been resolved so there's i don't leave things every once in a while I'll leave one that you know i think is okay slick i think it looks good and then i and i you know i, I just leave it there to bug me and the whole time i'm working on one painting i'm looking at it kind of like what 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 do you want? Because it's talking to me, it's bugging me. So um, anyway, but that's my process. So. What about you, Paul? Um, I used to work just on one piece at a time and usually there was lots of elements in it and they were large. So I sort of would have to keep working on them until I resolved them. But then I started changing and working on multiple pieces and I was traveling a lot, doing them like in residencies and stuff. So sometimes I would start bunch of things then wouldn't be able to finish them all so I bring them back and then I have to go back to school or something like that so I put them away for a while and I a couple of them I've taken out and I've looked at them but it's it's very different I find it almost impossible to get back into that space that I was in then so I left them and I sort of wait for the moment sometimes I've been able to go back into them but most of the time I don't rework things either I don't go back into them from previous times I try to go with the moment then with the feelings and whatever I was going through at that time because I think it would be a, such a different thing back you know, now. Right. Um, we have one more question. Um, this uh, viewer asks if the if you guys can mention or talk about other artists that have influenced you. I can start again if you'd like. Yeah sure. That is an very easy question for me actually my grandfather who i never had the honor of meeting he passed away a couple years before i was even born was a professional photographer in manhattan and long island in the 50s and 60s he had a dark room in his home he was lucky enough to have photographed Capote, The Beatles, Bridget Bardot, and the list goes on. <laughs> so I do have some of his slides and his negatives and some of his work can be seen online, even though it's very, very old. Uh, he is my inspiration. He is definitely a person who's influenced my work. I have a tendency not to Photoshop. I will brighten my images if I am inside a location 
typically when the windows are you know boarded or shut it's very dark so i will brighten up my images a little bit but i will not photoshop because my grandfather who was not able to do that wasn't able to do it and he is by far the most amazing influence and artist in my opinion <laughs> so i just really look up to that and definitely my grandfather definitely right who's next <laughs> um, I, I'll, you can go. <laughs> I'll go after. <laughs> um, so I was very lucky as a young artist to be mentored by the abstract expressionist Clifford Still. Um, and um, um, I, I knew him and uh, we would meet and he looked at my work and he would talk and I would listen. Um, <laughs> And um, he sent me to Skowhegan um, in Maine um, on a scholarship when he won the prize for painting um, from Skowhegan. And that changed my life forever. Um, I knew I always wanted to be a painter. I, you know, I came out of the egg kind of wanting to be a painter. Um, but having the, um, having someone like him and I, you know, I was so young that I didn't really even understand how important it was um, to tap me, you know, and, and to say, you, you'll, you got it, do it, go. Um, and so he, ha he's remained like church to me for my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when I'm really stuck, I look at his work or I, I go and see his work and, um, and I feel that encouragement to this day. And it's an extraordinary gift. Wow. I'm so thankful for it. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Daniel? That was really awesome. So for yeah. me, um, I, I love looking at the work of abstract expressionists. I love being able to be in a physical space surrounded by paintings that are enormous and bigger than like me and um, you know, full of color, like full of color, full of marks and the, that kind of spontaneity and stuff that that kind of goes into it but also you know that it's still really careful and planned at the same time kind of um so um one of my favorite artists uh that i always go back and look at is cy twombly and uh a contemporary artist that i'm really interested in and that definitely inspires my use of texture is jose parla um so he's kind of started out as a graffiti artist and he his work um in person when you see it it's just it literally looks like it could be a chunk of of wall like some carved out you know put into a show uh and i just always think about how he's able to create all that heavy texture and i just love it so uh, those are those are my top two right now <laughs> um and I, I love that deborah brought up skowhegan i didn't even realize how that was an influence for me too i when I was there, I learned about an artist named Christian Batowski, who does um, these sort of uh, uses old photographs and stuff, but his work, his lighting is really important. These sort of dark images that always stayed with me. It didn't sort of, didn't know how it was going to come out in my work, but then when I started doing these houses with the lighting, it kept bringing me back to his sort of idea of the lighting, how important it was, and sort of just drawing you in with it. And um, other artists, I mean, there's a lot of artists there. <laughs> Max Beckman, I used to love how he jam-packed uh, paintings with imagery, and I, used to, I was doing that a lot. And um, I love the work of George Tucker, who does all these um, narratives, which I always loved, that they always had something odd going on in them. And, and then more recently, I've, um, I've always loved the playfulness of Red Grooms, and I want to sort of I love some of his big installations and I keep thinking I want to build one of these houses that people could walk in and interact with it on a totally different level than just peeking at. That would be really great. Really interesting. Yes, do that. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's see. I'd love to see that. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you all for your answers. That was really great. Really interesting questions. Really interesting answers. Yes. <laughs> Thank you everyone watching and, and thank you artists. I learned so much, you know, I, I thought I knew something about your work already, but mm -hmm. I feel like I learned so much in the last 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, 
And I'd like to thank you, Carly, um, all of you artists for sharing your time and your insight. Um, and I'll thank the audience for tuning in as well. Um, just a reminder that we do have one more of these um, panel conversations scheduled for December 3rd. So um, please come. Uh, if you'd like to join us, you can visit hexer.org to register. And again, as a reminder, the Long Island Biennial is on view at the museum through January 10th. So please come by, um, go to the website and schedule your visit. Um, and you can learn more about the exhibition and all the artists there as well. Um, and I think we'll sign off. <laughs> um, so I'll say stay well and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all so Good much. Night. Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Very great. Thank you. Take care. Well, wear a mask. <laughs> Bye. Bye.